that we are all here because we have agreed to move with one another this season in learning sacred organizing, the process of building and exercising our collective power toward a horizon where life can flourish for all beings and for our shared home, Earth. One thing we can all agree on is that we can't do it alone. We're stronger together. The work of Levin Community Land and Housing has cohorts spanning Washington, Multnomah West, Multnomah East, and Clackamas counties, and we work in partnership with the Southeast cohort. We are rooted in our communities, in our faith traditions, in our land, and in the practices of anti-racism and anti-oppression. And the people for whom we each commit to those practices, we are so much bigger than this Zoom screen. So thank you all for being here tonight and recognizing the interconnectedness of ourselves, as well as the systems we wish to reimagine re together, including land, housing, and immigration, among many others. Now I would like to take a moment to invite everybody to put into the chat your name, if you have a core team, the name of your core team or community that you're here with. Um, and so that we can all see who is in the room together. Janelli, hi Janelli from Covenant Prez. Jennifer with St. Andrews. Heather with Levin, so good to see you all. Dana with First Unitarian. Jane, John, Debbie, good to see you guys. Hi, Alyssa. Hey, Sarah, Ellen, Sue. It's so good to see everybody tonight and so good to be here with you all. Hi, Jan, Ellis, Bob with Portland First UMC. Good to see you guys. So fun to have everybody in the room. I am going to go ahead. If you haven't yet, go ahead and still put your name and your community in the chat. Um, and now I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Alyssa to introduce herself and lead us in a grounding. Hi, everyone. Good evening. My name is Alyssa. I'm the East County Heartbeat Holder. I use she, her pronouns. And I'm going to lead us through our land acknowledgement and also uh, bring us to a place where our hearts and our full selves are in a space so we can learn tonight about how each of us is adding to this greater collective power through our own public stories. We acknowledge this ancestral and unceded territory of the peoples of the Multnomah, Wasco, Clackamas, Kathlamet, Cowlitz, Willamette, Tumwater, and the Cascade brand, bands of the Chidukan people Dwells and banded the Kalapuya and many other tribes who made their homes along the Columbia, Wimal, and the Willamette, Willamette River. Today, we acknowledge the region's diverse, vibrant Native communities who are still connected to this land. Indigenous peoples 70,000 strong, with more than 280 tribes and at least 18 unique languages, both local and distant. We extend our deepest gratitude to our siblings and elders, past and present, who have stewarded this land and who carry on tribal traditions for present and future generations. Let's take a moment of silence in gratitude and reverence. You might have noticed that uh, the pictures that came along with our acknowledgement today uh, involve a lot of light, and that's kind of what I'm bringing us into, um, thinking about the passage of darkness to light. So as you settle in, I want you to take a moment, close your eyes, maybe take your first deep breath of the day, in and out. And I want you to think back to a moment that you became activated about land and housing. Maybe there's a specific person that comes up for you. Tonight, I'm thinking about a mom I know in East County who couldn't use the emergency rental assistance program that she qualified for because she wasn't accustomed to using technology and she didn't speak English. There was this website that required her to upload documents from her phone to her computer using the specific format and file size. And that seemingly little systems barrier 
was the difference between accessing housing security for her family or not. I later found out that a full quarter of the families in my program were grappling with this exact same barrier and no one knew how to access this resource. So these kinds of moments and stories can frustrate us and they can paralyze us. And we can also use them as a source of our power. Stories have the power to change us and the people that we share them with and the system. So, Levita, if you could put up our last slide, uh, we're going to hold those stories that brought us here tonight. And we're going to ground ourselves in these words from Rumi, who said, I said, what about my eyes? He said, keep them on the road. I said, what about my passion? And he said, keep it burning. I said, what about my heart? He said, tell me what you hold inside it. I said, pain, sorrow. And he said, stay with it. The wound is the place where the light enters you. So I invite you to think one more time about your person, wherever they are and whatever they're experiencing tonight. Let's let them accompany us in this conversation. And may we and all those people that we're holding in our hearts move from pain and sorrow towards light. Friends, it's so good to be with you. Thanks, Alyssa, for grounding us with those beautiful images and with the reminder that this is about our whole community. I have the pleasure of sending us into one-to-ones tonight. And as is our practice uh, for listening and building relationships and building power among ourselves, everything that we do is about that weaving of relationship for the purpose of building power. We're going to break into breakout rooms for one-to-one -one conversations, this traditional practice of organizing that we are always in the midst of. And I'm about to put those questions in the chat for you in English and Spanish. So these are the questions you can spend time for 12 minutes with your partner. What's a moment when you remember being powerfully moved by a story you heard? Maybe it's the story, a story someone told you about their life. Maybe it's a book or something, a, a children's fairy tale. It can be anything, but what was the story that powerfully moved you? What is a story that you've noticed has come up in your one-to-ones over and over again as you've had them this year? So pick both or one of those and you'll be sent into your breakout rooms. Just welcome back. Don't forget to choose your language again. And I hope that your one-to-ones moved your hearts, reminded you of what is important to you, and maybe even started you thinking about some stories of your own that you want to tell because we are about to move into learning about how to tell those stories. So I am Reverend Julia Nielsen. I am one of the organizers with Levin Community. Uh, and I am so excited to get to talk to you tonight about where we are in the spiral. So as you might know, and some folks among us are new, so this language might be newer to you and feel free to put questions in the chat if you have them and they arise. But we are a part of the organizing spiral, the sacred organizing spiral. And in quarters throughout this nine month period, we move from and through encounter with ourselves, our neighbors and land, and then move through to unveiling we do research meetings, house meetings, we tell story, we show what we know, and then we move through until we get to action, which is coming, and then sacred pause. So we're in that unveiling season right now in the last month of practicing it. And tonight we're going to talk about what we mean by building power through public story. So what do we mean by that? 85% of the time that parents spend with children is spent storytelling, 85%. Stories are how we understand what's important to our families, communicate what is happening in our world and make sense of our choices. It's how we make meaning. Story is fundamental to being human and story is fundamental to organizing. So the question is why? Because organizing is, as we've all learned over the last few months and years together, organizing is about moving people. 
It's about moving their hearts and their feet and their money and their decisions. And the language of emotion is the language of movement. Think about it, motion and, and movement. They share the same root word. It's about moving people. So every single person has at least one compelling story. And each one of those stories feed into the story of all of us and drive us forward to change the world. We tell stories to connect and to heal and to motivate one another. And I would say that actually not just one story, but each of us has many stories to tell, many public stories to tell because our lives are complicated and diverse. For example, I could tell you a story about why I feel strongly about supporting the mental health of veterans because I come from a long line of veterans and I have two veterans who have completed suicide in my immediate family. Or I could tell you about why I organize for affordable housing as a home owning person. Or I could tell you about why I advocate for reproductive health care services in Idaho as a woman who has needed those services. Any life experience is a possible public story because stories are what we're made of. Terry Pratchett, an author that many of you may be familiar with, says it this way. People think that stories are shaped by people, but in fact, it is the other way around. So why do we, how do we actually move people to act? How do we shape stories and become shaped by them and shape others with ours? Moving others to act is about just a couple of things. It's about the how we do it, right? When we're trying to move people, it's about strategy and timelines and numbers, the, the real concrete pieces. But ultimately, it's about why. Why does it matter? Why does it matter to me? Why does this matter to you? Why does this matter to our future? If we want people to shake up their lives and challenge their routines and challenge themselves and take risks, then it's not enough to tell them what to do. How many of you have tried that? I know I have. Just agree with me. I know I'm right. Here's how you do it. Just do it. It doesn't have any effect on most of the people in my life. It's also not enough to tell them that it matters, that it's important. We have to make people feel the importance themselves. This is what we call in organizing self-interest. And some of us may have a little squidgy feeling about that word. It's kind of, it's neutral. It just means we all have it. We all have an interest in ourselves that then needs to connect to the self-interest of other people. So we need to talk about how to start writing a story. We've talked about like what it is as far as why it's important and what it has to do with organizing, but how do we write a public story? And later on, I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about places where we actually need to tell our public stories as a coalition and as people who are a part of this work. But first we need to know what a public story includes. So what a public story needs is a plot. All stories have plots, at least all good ones do. And the first, I, it's really easy to think about it in three parts. So the first thing that a story needs is a call to leadership or a story of who you are. And then you need a story of choice, this movement from, oh, this is who I am to here's the choice that I have to make and I'm asking you to make. And then it moves to action. So what, what now? What is it that we have to do? What am I imagining the future to become if your story and my story interweave and all of a sudden we find ourselves walking together toward a new future. So I wanna to talk to you about these pieces and you might wanna take a couple of notes if this is unfamiliar to you because you're gonna be using some of these in our time that follows our story teaching uh, because you're gonna write a story tonight. So first, let's go into that story of self or called the call to leadership. This is really about what moves you. So if you think about the story as having three parts, you can kind of build it with these building blocks or bricks. You can start with thinking about what's important to me? What moves me? What are my motivations? What's my calling? 
And then this, as you're describing it, helps others to understand you, not only to test whether they agree with you, but to have compassion for where you're coming from so they'll keep listening. I imagine that some of you, when I said that I have veteran suicide in my family, felt something, not only for my family, but for me. And maybe you wanted to know more. Even if you disagree with the military, even if you don't agree with something else that I say, that you can connect with because we're humans and our hearts touch one another. So that's what I mean about this this Mm -hmm. self piece. So you want to, in your story, be moving not through length or precision, but because you wanna share an insight. You do not have to tell your whole life story. This is where we sometimes make uh, some amateur errors. I know it's where I go wrong. You just tell your life's stories. This is why I first decided to take action against injustice is a good prompt for this. Think about an injustice you stood against. Why did you do that? You wanna open with a powerful statement And this story can be about anything, anything that matters to you. Anytime we tell public story, as long as it matters to you, it's going to be the right story. I will say that something that matters about this too is delivery. You want it to be from the heart. So sometimes it it can be tempting to think about like public testimony as dry or as boring or being filled with facts and figures. No. The most effective way to storytell is as a human person from the heart. It doesn't have to be smooth. It just has to be authentic to you. And I will make a note. It should also be true. It should also be true. You want to be concise. You want to communicate the most things in the fewest possible words. So one of the things that's true about telling public story is that editing is most of the work. You want to have the courage to go deep too. If this is that important to you, this thing that you're advocating for, that you want people to come alongside you in, that you have experienced yourself or love someone who has experienced this, it's important to you. You want to express that. What impact has it had? Don't be afraid to say something that hard. So the second part of a public story after you talk about your own self and why it's important to you is that you, the storyteller, faced a choice when you came upon this problem or you faced this injustice. You saw someone living under a bridge. This is my own story. I saw someone living under a bridge in 2014 when I moved to Portland. And he was a man who he was reading a book with his dog in a sleeping bag in the rain in Northeast Portland. And I thought to myself, no one should have to live in public like that. And I was faced with a choice and I felt like I had to respond. I had to respond. And what I did was I started working in housing and homelessness. So you have to ask, what's the choice that you made? What's the choice that you felt you were forced to make? Maybe if you couldn't, make a choice at that time, or you haven't gotten to that point of changing something yet, there's a tension you feel. What's that tension? If you did make a choice, what gave you the courage to do that? I would say that I started this work not only because I saw that man, but because people around me were also doing the work and I didn't feel alone in trying to fix a problem that I knew needed to be solved. So you want to introduce to the tension to whoever's listening to you from the president of the United States down to your neighbor that you're telling this story to. It doesn't matter who it is. We want what the hearer thinks they know and what they now can't deny they know because of what you said to be in conflict. Man, I thought this, but now I talked to Jules about it and I don't know if I can think that anymore. We want people to have to choose between the way the world is and the way the world should be and move toward what the way that the world should be. So we want everybody around us and ourselves to act in line with our values. So that's the choice. What's the choice we're asking people to make? So after self and choice, then it's time to move to action. What are you asking for? 
what's now? So what? Whatever choice you are making or had made, you want to make that everybody's choice. What's the challenge to your community because of what you know and what you've experienced? What's the alternative vision that you have for the world? What hopeful outcome do you want to create together? You just described the world as it is. Here's the problem. Here's why it's important to me. Now you want to describe the world as you envision it if we all come alongside you. That's the third part of public story. There's only three parts, your story, what choice needs to be made and how we're gonna get there, what it'll look like when we get there. I want you to think of a time when you were really deeply moved. Maybe you saw a story in the news or uh, someone you loved experienced an injustice. Maybe you saw something happen that scared or fascinated or angered you. I want you to think about that for a minute and maybe write down a quick note. You're gonna write a story in a minute, but I'm gonna tell you a story now. So pay attention to my story if you can and think about your own. What's happening? What's the plot? Maybe listen for my choice, my challenge, the action, any values that are coming up in mind. So I'm gonna tell it as though you have not just met me. My name is Julia Nielsen. And I am the six times great granddaughter of Mary Ann Funster, who is just one of my ancestors who have lived and continue to live in Columbiana County, Ohio, since the 1700s. Others who have lived in Columbiana since time immemorial and in the beech woods and the rivers I grew up playing in with my two brothers and my grandparents and my cousins include the endangered hellbender salamander and the butterfly mollusk and the speckled with lily. But two weeks ago, on February 3rd, a Norfolk Southern freight train heading to Conway, Pennsylvania, derailed in East Palestine, Ohio, in Columbiana, just 20 miles from my grandma's home. 38 rail cars went off the tracks and caught fire containing vinyl chloride, which causes cancer and is a flammable chemical that was used uh, to poison people and was used as chemical warfare in World War I. Many people, including all of my extended family and many of my childhood friends, drink from well-sprung groundwater in that very area. Groundwater that is now literally able to catch on fire and is bubbling with poison. As of Tuesday, February 21st, Norfolk Southern reported that chemical spill has been contained and that it has contaminated just only 15,000 pounds of soil and 1.1 million gallons of water. That's my family's water. Now, I don't any longer live in Columbiana County. I live in Multnomah County. I'm 3,000 miles away. My water is perfectly safe. And Ohio Governor Mike DeWine and the EPA have told East Palestine residents that the air and water that they are exposed to are safe to drink but they have not released any data to show that to be true. So I wonder why there are documented images of dead fish and an oily sheen along the Ohio River tributaries that my grandmother lives on days after the spill. Those streams are reintroduction sites for the hellbender salamander. Those streams are where I swam as a child and where my family has fished for seven generations. That water table flows through the entire Ohio River Valley and ultimately into the Mississippi River. This affects absolutely all of us. A pattern has been set long ago in environmental disasters like Flint, Michigan and the BP oil spill and is being repeated in East Palestine. First, government officials try to deny that any danger to the public exists and when that's no longer possible, they try to minimize it. And then those who are responsible are let off the hook with minimal consequences, including the EPA and Ohio's legislature. And while the Biden administration claims now that Norfolk Southern will be made to pay for the cleanup, there's not even the suggestion that any of their executives will be held criminally responsible. The residents of East Palestine and neighboring communities like my grandmother's deserve transparency around the EPA's plan for water and air quality monitoring and the data of air tests. They, and I would say we, 
including the animals and plants who cannot testify for themselves in front of politicians or can't call the White House to demand stricter policies on corporations, deserve transparency in testing and cleanup, and they deserve a clear plan for long-term environmental monitoring. We deserve justice. And our lives, any one of us on this screen, any one of us 25 million Americans who depend on the waters of the Ohio River to live, depend on that same justice. So think about that story that I just told, one of many stories I could have told you. Think about how I could have shaped that story differently to connect to different people. Think about what I could have practiced ahead of time to make it better, to write it down differently, to time it differently. A good story can be any length, but most public stories need to be less than two minutes long. And we know that stories are most persuasive when they're very carefully prepared. So if we want people to take us seriously, especially people with power, we need to take ourselves seriously and take the time ahead of time. As you get more practiced, you're gonna wanna take your stories deeper and play with them. This is just one of, I'd say a dozen public stories that I've told over the years, not even about the same thing, right? Different topics. You can play with your stories figure out which is gonna work in which space and with which people, what makes sense? Who hears parts of my story and who hears which versions of it? What contexts and audiences are more challenging for me? How can I practice that? And you might wanna think about how to level up on your story. So I have some growing to do in public storytelling. I need to think that more about how to gear uh, my story to different time frames or how to bridge a statistic mm -hmm. to a story, or how to tell or not tell difficult parts of a story well, how to protect people's dignity and privacy when I'm talking about those things. So I want you to think about what it is that your next step in public story is. Maybe you're very experienced and you need to make your stories much shorter. Maybe you've never written a public story before and your level is, I wanna write mine down. I wanna know how to tell a story to begin with. So we can move into a conversation. I wanna share a concrete example with, uh, with you of Adeline. Can we share Adeline's uh, video, Levita? This is one of our very own organizers who has um, testified successfully in front of some elected officials. I'm gonna ask Adeline some questions. Pay attention to Adeline's story. And I am a student at Oak Grove Elementary. Did you know that 238 children are homeless in the North Clackamas School District alone? That means about one in every 50 students in my school. Statistically, half of those kids will be held back a grade or two in their education. Why? Because they don't have a place to live. Kids are twice as likely to attend school regularly when they have a roof over their heads. Studies have also shown that homeless children are sick four times more often than children with homes. They will also be more likely to experience hunger, behavioral problems, and delayed de development if nothing changes. Giving kids a place to stay will build a happier and stronger community. That's why we need you to say yes to Project Turnkey, because all kids deserve a home. Thank you very much. And Levita is gonna bring Adeline up and we are gonna spotlight her and me. Add spotlight, there we go. So have you seen your own video before? Have you rewatched that? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So I have a couple questions for you. One is what made you want to give testimony about Project Turnkey? I saw this news story about the people who are against Project Turnkey. And one person said, think of the children. And I thought, that's exactly why we need Project Trinity. So I decided to give testimony so people could hear what I said. I need to say, yeah. So your testimony was really powerful and it was real tight. Like I was impressed with how much you said in such a short amount of time. How did you prepare for it? 
Um, I prepared by starting with a prompt to help me write the testimony. And I practiced saying it in front of my parents. And also I timed it to make sure it fit in the time. I also went to Target to find a green outfit, of course. Right, because everybody from Project Turnkey uh -huh. and Support wore green, right? Uh-huh. Yeah. That help. So you, you prepared with a prompt. You mm -hmm. practiced by saying it in front of other people who were your parents in this case. And you practiced for time. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's, so that's three pretty easy steps. What did, it, what did it feel like when your time allotment was cut from two minutes to one? Because I know that happened to you. Yeah. You thought you had more time than you did, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. yeah. At first, I was a bit stressed out, but my mom helped me cut it down a bit so it would fit the time frame. And actually, I like the shorter version better because it's more compelling and more to the point. So win-win. I think, yeah, it's totally a win-win. I mean, it's hard though, right? When you get, you find out like this thing you worked on really hard, now it has to be a little bit shorter. It yeah. was really good though. Wait, were you nervous and what made you nervous? Um, at first I was struggling a bit with writing the testimony. Um, and I was worried that the words wouldn't be good. And I was also nervous about talking in front of a lot of people. But when I got in the chair, I just felt a lot calmer and ready to do it. Well, I am so glad that you were brave enough to do it and that you gave us such an amazing example, because I think all of us in this room, all 50 adults now probably have a lot more courage to try to do something that you did so beautifully. So thank you, Adeline, for being willing to talk with us and for for passing Project Turnkey, which is Thank such you. a big deal. Good job. All right. Um, Anna is going to stay with us and we're going to bring Story up for just a tight minute because we want to talk a little bit about the work that Adeline just described. Uh, our Clackamas County cohort has been deep in the weeds with Project Turnkey, helping to turn motel sheltering into a real uh, housing opportunity for folks in the community. Um, so Story and Anna, you want to quick introduce yourselves and then share a little bit about what happened in the room that Public Story made possible. I'm Anna Heartbeat Holder for Clackamas County. Hi everyone, I'm Story and I'm on the Clackamas County design team. So what'd you see? What changed because of Public Story in that space? You want to start off with kind of like where we started? Yeah, so um, in October, uh, back whenever everything got started, we um, wanted to, we knew that we were going to have to organize this time. We had seen it go poorly in the past. We saw that we had not mapped the tower. We hadn't organized enough. So turnkey 1.0 got shut down. And so when 2.0 was coming around, we were like, we need to put some time and energy into um, coming alongside people to bring them along on this with us. We were going to need voices in there because we knew that um, a big part of the reason it got shut down before that there was only one narrative in the room. There was only one story being told about transitional housing, about Clackamas County, about who would use this. So we knew we needed to organize people to be able to tell a different story. So we did a training in October that um, 30 or so people, I think, came 30 to 40. 30 to 40. Oh, yeah, we had online too. Um, show, showed up to kind of learn how to give public story to tell the story of me, yeah. the story of us, the story of now. Um, so that's kind of how it started. And then that's who we saw come into the space, start coming with us in October and really changing the narrative of that room. And I think what was really compelling for me is seeing that at that initial training, um, when we asked at first, like, who felt ready to give public testimony? I think like a few people raised their hands. People were like, yeah, <laughs> like, and, no, thank you. <laughs> um, and then by the end, we asked again and they were like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so these are people who are like, by no means experts at public story, right? And like, maybe we're not feeling super confident about that, but they were willing. Um, and when they first came and told the stories, I was blown away because like, I felt them so compelling Cheers. because story cried yeah I definitely did because they were honest and they were personal right 
yeah. and they were clear. Yeah. Um, and we saw every time that also impact the other people in the room. Mm -hmm. One county staff member um, just last week at a public meeting shared that that our coalition showing up at these meetings um, changed the course of this vote, mm -hmm. that it made something possible in Clackamas County that just wasn't possible before. Mm -hmm. um, and he said that as he sat in the room, this was at the final turnkey vote where there were 50 people who were tested, showed up to testify yes, um, and 45 who showed up to testify no. Um, and he said, as he sat in that room, he was like overwhelmed <laughs> every time someone got up from our group to give testimony and said that they were the most compelling testimonies mm. he's ever heard in that space. Yeah. And again, it's not because we had experts, right? It's because people yeah. showed up with what mattered to them. Mm -hmm. They cared about it. And we also saw this really impact even the opposition in the room, especially in some of the early meetings. Um, where it was like the launching off point, because whenever you come prepared, when you come prepared with the statistics and the story, like bringing all of that together, people have to do a pretty big, like cognitive, a jump of cognitive dissonance yeah. to not then engage with the new story being told. And we were able to see some opposition actually engage with the story. And it seems too that in, especially in this case, it humanizes something that is really easy to dehumanize, yeah. right? We're talking about people who are not here. This doesn't affect, yeah. we're not talking about real people. And then the stories you all brought, it was real people. And you can't deny that you're talking to somebody who really, yeah. this matters to you. Yeah. 100%. Yeah, that, that was one of the things in the room that felt like really important mm -hmm. that I thought, even if we don't win this, this is why this matters. Because when there's a dehumanizing narrative, it's like it's our call to tell the human story that counteracts that. Yeah. Well, thank you all for doing that work. We're going to move into practicing stories now so that folks can join uh, Clackamas in its expertise and in its practicing of that that you've been doing for Project Turnkey. So here we go, friends. We have talked about, right, you have a story of self. You have a story of choice to make, and you have a story of action. Where do you want it to go? And we're gonna invite you for just five minutes to write something down. You don't have to get perfect. You don't have to have all the words. Just start to frame out, if I were to tell a story, maybe it's about housing. Why is, for example, we're about to try to pass the governor's budget for 1.4, one billion dollars for housing and human services why is that important why do you care that we have money at the state level for housing just why is this important to me what choice do we need to make and what will it make different if we have it it could be about anything keep it simple we're going to give you five minutes and then you're going to get swept into rooms again and talk to your friend your partner about what was hard about that process what's easy about it for you, and what questions do you still have about how to write a story. And if you got to a point where you think you can tell a story, just practice in the room. Just practice in the room and see if you can. And then we're gonna talk about the practice and you'll get to ask some questions. So first, five minutes to just jot some things down and try to create a story for yourself. I hope that your process of wrestling with your story a little bit out loud helped you. Right now, I'm going to turn it over to Josh Dunham, who is going to help us do a little evaluation of that and give you all a bit of space to ask questions. Josh, take it away, friend. Thank you. Hey, everybody. I'm Josh Dunham, he, him pronouns. I am the pastor at Covenant Presbyterian Church in Gresham, and it's good to see many of you again. And I'm hoping you're having a beautiful cohort cycle. I feel weird not being part of it this time, and but it's wonderful to jump in here and be with you all. So now we're going to reflect on the practice of public story that we've learned tonight and on the stories you wrote. This is a moment where all the little bits and pieces swimming around in our heads and breakout rooms come together and we get a sense of what is happening in this room collectively i.e. what we learned, what we noticed, where we feel energized, or where we feel stuck or confused. I'm going to drop a couple of questions in the chat, and I'll give you two minutes to reflect uh, silently or in writing. So the first question is, what new skill or resource or aha moment 
did you encounter in the practice of writing this story? And then the second question is, what is the next step for you in public storytelling? Examples of this are writing it down, presenting it in public, writing one for a different audience, making your story more powerful, working on telling a shorter story, maybe something that you heard from Jules that you reflect on as similar or somebody else. So feel free to take a couple of minutes and go ahead and reflect on this uh, by writing something down. And then I'll invite you by raising your hand. You can do it either physically or do it via the uh, reaction button raising hand. And I'll give you a call on you if you'd like to go ahead and share your story and reflection. All right, so now I want to invite a couple of people, if they feel comfortable doing it, to share their story that they wrote and to get some feedback. Is there anybody that would feel comfortable doing that? If you feel comfortable, please raise your hand. Uh, you can do that again by using the reaction raise hand or by physically raising your hand in your picture, and I will jump between screens trying to find you. But feel free to raise your hand if you're feeling uh, comfortable to share your story. Know that this is a good environment to learn in, and we are kind and loving in our reflections with people. Wonderful. Ellis, I'll invite you. Go ahead. Yes, please. All right. I have not finished my story, and my family is, you know, buzzing about the house, so there's probably shouting and lots of noise in the background. But let me go ahead and see what I can pull up. Um, so my name is Ellis. I use they, them pronouns. I am a part of the Westside Queer Resource Center and in community with Christ Church um, here in Hillsborough, Washington County. I grew up in the church. I went to private school five days a week with chapel on Fridays. I attended Awanas and later youth groups on Tuesday nights and church services on Sunday mornings, along with extended or family dinners with my extended family who was ultra conservative. My summer camps that I attended were Christian. I pledged purity. I memorized all the songs and verses to make me good Christian. I learned the Bible well and developed a strong faith. In spite of all this, I didn't feel like I fit. I knew deep down, I don't belong here. As I grew older and went through my rebellious stages, I still held tight to my relationship with God, but I didn't connect to the church. I found rejection as a child because I was poor. I found rejection when I questioned the rules around the LGBTQ plus community. I found rejection as a pregnant teenager. I found rejection as a teen parent. I ducked my head and tucked my tail between my legs, making myself and my child as small as possible to disappear in the church bodies. I'm married twice and it failed spectacularly both times, which resulted in several more kids and some crazy divorce stories. I was pitied as a single parent, as a victim, of failed marriages. I still searched for a place where I belonged. Somewhere in all of this, I found a word that I've been searching for my whole life, a label that fits me, non-binary, queer. I was rejected again by the church communities, but this time they had a different message. We welcome you, they said. We accept you, they said. But when I really looked into it, I realized they tolerated me. They were welcoming me in order to change me. It wasn't even pity this time. It was manipulation. And I left. This process has been deeply painful. This story is not just my own. This is the story of so many of us who have faith, who have a connection and a relationship with Christ and who do not have a place in his body, in the church. What my goal is in all of this and sharing my story and working with this group and many others is to create a healing, a reconciliation, to start examining what is a message of church or religion or control and what is a message of God, Christ? How do we change who we are? And when do we stand up and say, this isn't right? How long do we stay a part of a body because we're doing all the right things and going through the motions, but it doesn't fit? 
How do we create a space where people fit? Everyone fits. Thank you, Alice. Thank you for going first and thank you for telling your very beautiful and brave story. Do we have any feedback that we'd like to, to provide for Ellis uh, as they have bravely told their, their powerful story? Like I said, I, had, I kind of had a rough start and then I had to wing it on the end part. So that, like that call to action piece I feel is lacking like a specific call to action. It's more of asking a question which is kind of intriguing folks towards action, but not giving them a specific action step. So if you have advice on that, I'm welcome. Question, Alice, when you were writing this, what audience were you thinking of like specifically? Did you have somebody or some community in particular in mind? Um, I've been doing a lot of work um, in just trying to find healing and creating faith spaces for queer folks. And I think that's really challenging to traditional churches um, because so many people were raised the way I was. Um, and so I feel like a lot of folks within faith communities or who grew up in a church can connect to kind of some of the background of my story. Um, so I guess my hope with that is like creating a connection and then seeing the dissonance. Thank you. Well, feel free to continue giving feedback in the chat for Ellis. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would feel comfortable sharing their story? Maybe they were working on also and would like some feedback too. Also, if you're not feeling comfortable for sharing your story in front of everybody, do you also, now we can move on to it. Do you have any questions about the process? Was there anything that came up as you were writing or you were listening to other people share their stories that came up for you that you had questions about. Feel free to ask those questions now. You can put them in the chat uh, or feel free to also raise your hand if you would like to uh, lift a question for the group. No questions. You all know exactly what you're gonna do. This is amazing. You are all like amazing organizers now. I'm gonna call on all of you whenever I have anything that I need public testimony for. Okay. Okay, I'll go ahead and ask a question since everybody's all quiet and I've already been brave once. Um, my question would be, how do you adjust the story to make sure it's fitting different audiences? I have some thoughts on that. I'm sure other people in the room do too, but um, my experience is I think about who, like, where am I going to tell this story? You know, which room is it going to be in? You, you kind of described that already in yours. And, um, and then I try to think about what those folks values are or what's important to them. And I try to use that language, not in a manipulative way, but to see if we can build a bridge of understanding. And then I change kind of some of the ways I would usually describe something to match that or try to, you know, be more familiar to what they're accustomed to. So that's one tactic that I use to, it's like, it's like speaking two languages, right? Like trying to help be, be understood. And the format too, because like some communities like there's different formats that make sense. Some folks would be really comfortable in a public testimony if they're like, uh, some of my more evangelical Christian friends would understand that format in a different way than, um, than some of the folks that I work with who don't come from that background, what that, what that structure is. You know, and I'll just reflect that, that personal testimony and things that are personal to your story or people that you know who you are, intimately connected with are extremely important no matter what room you're in uh, and can be really powerful. Uh, kind of reflecting on what Anna and Story uh, had reflected earlier is that the group uh, coming into Clackamas County into that session about uh, Project Turnkey and being able to share personal story and what was personally impactful was the most meaningful testimony that they heard from the commission that commissioners told that a commissioner told them about. So it's one of those things about having that truly being comfortable with sharing personal 
um, you know, making it uh, in essence, really something that comes from your heart and soul is important. Um, don't try to just gloss over in generalities, uh, I think is very, very important. So. Hi, this is Carol. Yeah, Carol. Yeah. Yeah. And it was something that I was actually talking with some colleagues because they're um, uh, looking for someone to be on a commission. I said that you want someone where the people see that person as us and so that what they say has impact because they say, see them as us right i said i would not be the right person because i will be a them right <laughs> short asian not very glamorous you know woman um in this setting would not be effective that you need someone who kind of can see that connection. That's why I think Adeline's testimony was so impactful because here she is, this kid that looks like their kid. And so it's like, oh, it's one of our kids who is talking about her friends and why it's important. And so the people that she feels are important are not them, but ours. And I would just briefly um, speak to the tension of that. And I think in some of the work that we do and organize, because um, on the one hand, there is something to be said about speaking to a context where you want folks to be seen as, a, as an us. But on the other hand, we are trying to expand who us is. And I may just have a little bit of uh, self-interest in making sure that short Asians are also seen as us in other people's rooms. Um, and so, 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 and I, I think this is real. So like the, the point is that the story makes connection so that that us is expanded. Thanks for that, Chris. Josh, I think we need to move into next steps and celebrations. So, so pass it now over to John Rogers. Well, I just wanted to thank all of you for the wonderful energy and presence at the assembly on Sunday. And maybe if you have a full screen or a gallery, everybody can kind of wave their hand or something. If you happen to be there, one of the 400 plus folks that showed up uh, to turn out to say yes to housing and wholeness. Um, there'll be some information about the campaign that's coming in the next few weeks. And we invite you to pay attention to your emails and your companions about the opportunities to participate. We'll be following up with you about meetings with elected officials, opportunities for public testimony like we practice tonight, hosting house meetings and countering NIMBYism trainings for your own congregations. So here are some of the gather the pictures about the April coalition gathering on the 16th. Uh, we focused on issues and campaigns. Sunday, a very powerful event. Um, we had the commissioner there giving her support, and now that we're going to see a video. Oregon 97015 and delegating signature authority to the chair and county commissioner to execute all documents reasonably necessary to complete the closing of the purchase of the property. Second. Um, you, commissioner Schrader has made a, a motion for the approval of the board order and Commissioner Sabas has seconded that motion. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Tony, take the poll. Commissioner Schrader. Aye. Commissioner West. Nay. Commissioner Schall. No. Commissioner Savas. Aye. Chair Smith. Aye. Motion passes 3-2. Thank you very much. make a note that we'll be one week later in the month next month for our 
conversation about and training about issues and campaigns. So it's been a fantastic have you with us. We are so thankful for all of the work that you all are doing across the state to make sure that our neighbors are housed, that we are using our land in ways that uh, have honor, honoring it and each other. And we are so thankful for all of the public stories you are sharing all over the place to make sure that this work moves forward. So have a good night. We'll play some music as we go out and you can uh, choose which room you wanna go to as the core teams are gathered.